Hi AP World students, Mrs. Longnecker here, and this video looks a little bit different from my usual videos because I am actually going to present a content lecture for this video. So it may be a little bit longer than most of my videos, but hopefully um, this will get you a good supplement to what you've been reading about the Mongols. And this lecture is called The Bridge Builders. And our overarching question for this is what impact did the Mongols have on history? So as you're getting ready to take some notes, um, you are certainly welcome to add notes to any reading notes that you've taken about the Mongols so far, or get out a fresh piece of paper for some notes. There's gonna be a lot of text on the screen as I talk, um, because it allows me to remember uh, what I wanna say in the video. It also supports those of you who are more visually oriented, so you can hear me as well as see it on the screen. I would encourage you not not to try and copy down every single word, especially in places where I have quotes on the screen, um, but instead to continue working on taking notes that are going to make sense to you when you come back to these later on. So let's dive in and talk about these bridge building Mongols. And the first thing we want to talk about is the fact that the Mongols have different images. Depending on when and where you learned about the Mongols, you might have a very different view about who they are. So here's a couple of historical examples of how the image of the Mongols in Western eyes has changed over time. In the 13 and 1400s, so during and right after the Mongol, the height of the Mongol Empire, if you read uh, European documents about the Mongols, you would see language very similar to this document, which is an excerpt from uh, an English poem known as the Canterbury Tales. And it says, this noble king was called Genghis Khan, who in his time was of great renown, that there was nowhere in no region so excellent a lord in all things. He lacked nothing that belonged to a king. Right? This is high praise for the Mongols. He is excellent. He lacks nothing. Um, he was of great renown. He is called a noble king. But look now at this next document, and you can see that by the 1700s, the Western view of the Mongols is very different, right? By the 1700s, we have the Mongols being called barbarians. And this quote here from Voltaire, who is a French writer, calls them wild sons of rapine, who live in tents, in chariots, and in the fields, who detest our arts, our customs, and our laws, and therefore mean to change them all, to make this splendid seat of empire one vast desert like their own. And this is some negative language, and probably your view of the Mongols has been more shaped like this 1700s view of the Mongols as barbarians versus the positive view of the 13 and 1400s. So it's worth thinking a little bit about who are the Mongols, what were they really all about, and trying to break away from any stereotypes that we might have about them to have a clearer picture of the Mongols. So Overall, as a whole, we don't see the Mongols as representing significant technological breakthroughs of any kind. And this isn't surprising. The Mongols were a, originally a nomadic people, and so their access to technology is actually fairly significant because as they move from region to region throughout their, their seasonal migrations with their herds of animals, um, they would have encountered a lot of technology from a lot of different places. But not being settled means that they may not have been as um, culturally, right, as interested in the kind of technological innovations that we see in urbanized places where you know, specialized labor and competitive labor is perhaps developing new kinds of things. We don't see the Mongols representing any breakthroughs in terms of new religions, although we will talk about Mongol religion a little bit later. We see very few books or plays written by Mongol authors. Again, a nomadic people, um, largely not invested in literature because books are heavy. And if you have to carry around everything, right, having an oral tradition that is passed down 
out loud spoken word or song and music, that's much more common in um, pastoral nomadic traditions such as the Mongols. So they don't leave behind a lot of written artifacts. They don't bring about new crops or new agricultural methods. Again, nomads more interested than in animals than plants. They leave behind relatively few artifacts or buildings specific to their culture. The thing the Mongols built extensively though were bridges. And we want to ask ourselves, why is it significant that the Mongols built physical bridges in many places? And we'll talk about the bridges as a metaphor a little bit later. So, right, it would be easy to take just this slide and say, well, the Mongols are barbarians. They, they don't have books or artifacts or new technologies. Like, why do we even care about them? So let's dive a little bit deeper and get some specifics then about what the Mongols were all about and what they were like. So this is a map here of the, um, the, the Khanates, the four main um, territories controlled by Mongol rulers. We have the Great Khanate in East and Central Asia in orange, um, from the homeland of Mongolia all the way into China, into Korea. We have um, in Central Asia, the Khanate of Jagadai um, in Northern Central Asia and spreading towards Eastern Europe, the Khanate of the Golden Horde, which conquered parts of what is now Russia. And then the Ilkhanate of Persia, which conquers Persia and uh, Mesopotamia or modern day Iraq. You can see on this slide as well, um, some red arrows indicating Mongol raids into some other regions that were um, not ultimately successful, right? We see that the Mongols attempted to conquer Japan. They were pushed back due to both weather and um, forces that they encountered in Japan and couldn't overcome. Um, they attempted to take over territories in Southeast Asia, including Champa and Sumatra and Java, and none of these was ultimately successful. Um, the Mongols were primarily a land-based empire, and anything maritime or sea-based wound up not being particularly successful in Mongol conquest. But this is an enormous empire. If we think of the four Khanates together representing the Mongol Empire, right, this is the biggest land empire in world history up to this point. This is massive and we're controlling territory that had been controlled by really powerful states, right? China and Persia and right, we're getting close to Arabia. So there's a lot of really powerful people who are being conquered by the Mongols. And to start us off, we want to talk about Chinggis Khan, who's the most famous of the Mongol leaders. He is the one who led the Mongols out of Mongolia in the initial conquests in East Asia. Um, your textbook and this slideshow is going to call him Chinggis Khan. In older texts, you may see it um, in English as Genghis Khan. Um, scholars say that this is more close to how it would likely have been pronounced. So we're going to go with Chinggis. He's a relatively, what we might say is a modern guy. He was committed to a professional and mobile army. He's committed to trade and commerce. He was interested in a secularized system of laws. That word secular should go in your notes right now. Secular means non-religious. So he's investing in a law code that is not rooted in religion, which is really different from many of the law codes of his day. Think about the influence of Confucianism in China or Islam in the Middle East or Christianity in Europe and how those religious traditions heavily influence the political systems in each of those regions. For the Mongols, their, their law codes and their political system is really separate and apart from religious tradition. And along with that, you see on the slide right here, there's religious tolerance to a very high degree in the Mongol Empire. So let's talk about the military, right? Because that's what the Mongols are kind of most famous for, is being powerful warriors. And it is true that the Mongols killed basically anyone who resisted them. Um, they leveled multiple large cities like Baghdad or Nishapur in Persia. Um, some Chinese cities were also just completely destroyed. And the, the Mongol strategy, um, 
it's told that the Mongols would get come to the city gates and they would give the people an opportunity to surrender. Those who surrendered um, were allowed to live relatively peaceably. Um, men of military age would often be executed in the city, but everyone else was allowed to live peaceably. They were allowed to join the Mongol Empire. But if the city resisted even a little bit, um, right, we see a quote here from a Persian observer of the Mongols, right, that it was commanded that the town should be laid waste in such a manner that the site could be plowed upon. So they're going to destroy the city to basically an open field and that not even cats and dogs should be left alive. And this was a a strategic move on the part of the Mongols, in part to destroy enemies and prevent them from coming back later on, but mainly to instill fear in neighboring cities who heard about what the Mongols did and then would be more likely to surrender. It actually made it easier for the Mongols to, to conquer more territory by being so harsh with resistors um, because then other people would just surrender and they would be able to take those territories without having to fight. 18.4 million people, this is the estimate, killed in China, millions more killed in Persia and in Russia. Um, so there's no getting around the fact that as a conquering warrior culture, the Mongols were violent and were what we might say in the 21st century, pretty brutal and harsh in their strategies of conquest. It's not super uncommon for their day and age, but to us, it can seem rather shocking. Their military tactics were superior to other tactics that had been um, available at the time. They had extreme discipline and loyalty. Um, people were, you were expected to be devoted to people in your unit or your group of soldiers. They used any advanced weapons that they encountered from cultures that they ultimately defeated. The Mongols adopted and then used against the next people that they were going to conquer. So again, we say that the Mongols aren't necessarily developing new technologies of their own, but they are utilizing and spreading knowledge of advanced technologies that they encountered. They also focused on intelligence gathering. They had a huge spy network. They wanted to learn geography in order to gain a military advantage. It was said by many that if you saw a Mong or a um, a merchant caravan come through from Mongol territory into your town, you could be pretty much guaranteed that there were at least some military spies in that caravan. And it was said because it was largely true. The Mongols were would sent out spies because they wanted to um, look into places that they might wish to conquer later and come in with knowledge that would allow them to be successful, which they were. And as nomads, right, speaking of those merchants, Nomads understand the importance of trade. So let's take a step back here just for a second and think about the lifestyle of a pastoral nomad. That phrase pastoral nomad refers to the idea of a pasture, that these are nomadic peoples who are not hunting and gathering. They are raising animals and taking them seasonally from pasture to pasture, summer grounds to winter grounds. And as such, right, they have access to some resources that they need for a comfortable lifestyle, but there are other resources that are only being produced by sedentary, settled cultures in cities. And so nomads are well known as middlemen for trade. They would go to a city near their summer pastures, trade with the people there. As they move on to their winter pastures, they're going to take goods from that city to a new place. They're going to trade those goods, um, get new things. They're going to bring them back and forth. And so nomads in general tended to be good trade partners to settled people. And as originally nomadic people, the Mongols understood how significant and important trade could be for their civilization. So when they conquered places, they built up the infrastructure for trade. They built roads and physical bridges across their empires, across their territories. They extended the Grand Canal that you read about with the Song Dynasty in China. They actually extended it. A canal is a man-made river um, that allows boats and trade to move by water um, through landlocked areas, which is a really important and effective way of moving goods during this time. 
They set up post offices and trading posts. Marco Polo was just completely um, overwhelmed by the postal system. He talked about you know the vast number of horses that were just set aside for the use of messengers, that messages could travel all the way across the Khanate in a very short amount of time. He, he says that it's so costly that it baffles speech and writing, right? So much money and resources are put into communicating across the empire that um, that he just can't even believe that that kind of money is being spent. Um, the Mongols under, um, understood trade to be so important that they protected merchants. They gave them a higher status within their societies. They set up merchant organizations and associations that allowed merchants to support and to protect one another. And this is a big deal, particularly in China, where culturally um, Confucianism has a suspicion of people who make too much money. And so merchants were a relatively low class within Chinese society. And so this is a big upheaval for, for Mongols um, to do in China. They allowed safe passage to anyone and everyone within their boundaries. Um, this is a really big deal. Laws against robbery and theft were so severe that it became incredibly safe to travel through the Mongol Empire. Like bandits, it wasn't, you could not make enough from robbing a caravan to outweigh the risk of getting caught robbing a caravan. Um, so one of our Persian observers um, talks about, right, and for this reason, um, their houses and the carts in which they store their wealth had neither locks nor bolts, right? So they don't even have to lock their doors. They don't have to lock up their stuff because nobody's going to steal it. And this is a really big deal. Um, and this is somewhat revolutionary for the time. There had not been this degree of safe trade, safe passage. And if you think back to that map and just how much territory the Mongols encompassed, can you imagine having safe passage from Eastern Europe, practically Central Europe, so from basically Hungary, all the way across Eurasia to China. Safe travel, safe passage, you just have to deal with the geography, but you don't have to worry about the, the violent threats of bandits or robbers on your way. That's a really, really big deal. The Mongols are also fairly religiously tolerant. Um, the, the traditional Mongol belief system is an animistic system. Um, so it is invested in um, the belief in spirits and in nature um, and not really any investment in spreading their own beliefs to anyone in particular. A lot of Mongol leaders were interested in the religions they encountered as they conquered new places. We see an interest in um, Mongol leaders in China, for example, adopting um, some Confucian values, but a lot of Buddhist values in China. Um, when they go into Persia and Mesopotamia, um, uh, the Mongol leaders adopt Islam just rapidly. Uh, in Europe, less adoption of Christianity, but an openness to Christianity when Christian missionaries from Europe made their way into China. Um, so right, just a very open kind of cultural attitude toward religion. They offered tax benefits to most religious leaders in order to gain support of those religious leaders in their territories, um, which is a pretty strategic political move. A couple of exceptions to this that are important to notice, right? When we talk about religious tolerance, it's always with a little bit of an asterisk. It's, it's tolerance, but it's not universal acceptance of all beliefs and all traditions. Um, for example, in Russia, um, the Russian Orthodox Church was involved in resisting Mongol conquest. And so then they were targeted and persecuted by Mongol leaders as they conquered territory in Russia. A lot of Russian churches were completely destroyed and um priests were um, treated very, very harshly in Russia. There's a lot of writings about that. Um, and in China, because there was such a conflict between Chinese and Mongols ruling China, Chinese did not see the Mongols as a legitimate dynasty. 
in large part. And so there was actually a resistance among Confucian scholars, for example, against Mongol leadership. And the Mongols, for their part, didn't trust the Chinese because they thought the Chinese might try and undermine them and try to boot them out of China, which they absolutely did. The Mongols were not wrong about this. And so they brought Muslims from Persia into China to be the bureaucrats and administrators and actually run the government. And so there's a, a tolerance and a preference for Islam and a suspicion of Confucianism. But it's also a case where this is one of the reasons why Islam makes its way, why and how Islam makes its way all the way into China during this time period is by the specific and intentional actions of Mongol leaders. Now, I don't have a slide on this, but I just want to briefly mention before I jump into my next point, I want to talk a little bit about Mongol social structure a little bit. As a pastoral nomadic society, the Mongols had a more egalitarian or equal um, view of men and women. There were still gender roles within or gendered roles within Mongol society. But for example, in China, the Mongols actually outlawed foot binding for women um, because they, they found the whole practice just horrifying and they would never want their women um, to have their feet bound because Mongol women needed to be able to ride horses just like Mongol men because they were responsible for raising animals, for defending their people in some cases. Um, and so women were not necessarily equals socially in the sense of we don't see any female Mongol rulers particularly, um, but we do see an expansion of opportunities for women in some regions under Mongol rule. But because of their right, tolerance for the cultures of the people that they conquered, it was very short-lived um, and not a, a lasting change for women in most of these regions. Things kind of went back to exactly how they had been before the Mongols came, after the Mongols left. Now, we talked about right, the physical bridges as the Mongols extended roads across Eurasia, but we also need to think of these bridges as a metaphor, that the Mongols are responsible for linking people all the way across the Eurasian continent. And one of the things this means is that Asian products, which were highly desirable and very expensive, became more available in places like Europe. Europeans who weren't producing the same quality of goods at the same prices, and in some cases not even producing the same goods as China or India or other parts of Asia, and the Europeans had limited access to those goods because they weren't part of that Indian Ocean trade network that you've learned about. They suddenly were getting this flood of goods along the reopened Silk Roads that the Mongols were promoting with their physical bridges and their expansion of trade. Europeans then are able to travel to Asia. This is a picture here on the screen of Marco Polo, um, who traveled to Asia. He comes back with some really wild stories, some of which are true, most of which are big exaggerations. Um, but the idea is that Europeans' eyes are now open to what Asia and China in particular has to offer. They've been connected now in a way that had not previously existed. And the Europeans are just on fire for Chinese stuff, for Chinese culture. People are just really interested in what they can get out of China. And after the death of the early Mongol leaders, as the Mongol Empire collapses, um, then this idea of the long-term bridges starts to become problematic. After the fall of the Khanates, which happened relatively rapidly, the Mongol Khanates were not a long-lasting empire. They were geographically huge, but not very long-lasting. And trade across Asia became more dangerous, more difficult, and more expensive. The roads were no longer being maintained. Different rulers are popping up in different regions and they are competing with one another at times. And even if they're not competing with each other, they're not cooperating to allow trade across a region because they each have their own rules, their own taxes. And it just suddenly becomes a lot more difficult to get goods from Asia into Europe but they still want them. The Europeans still want all of this really good stuff that they had been exposed to from Asia. And so European merchants 
start looking for a way to get back to what they had had when the Mongols ruled. And so, for example, in the 1400s, the Portuguese start looking for a quicker route to Asia around the coast of Africa and Columbus in the late 1400s at sails west. One of the things he took with him was Marco Polo's journal, a description of life in the Mongol Khanates. And Columbus was looking for China. He was trying to find access to Mongol China to get the goods that his people had had a century earlier. And so the Mongols as bridge builders are physically connecting people across a continent, but also metaphorically connecting people by building a desire for goods and connections that people had and then lost and sought to gain again. Okay, this was fast. We went through a lot of stuff really quickly. So I would encourage you to pause here and look over the notes that you took today as I as you watch this video. Right? What is your big takeaway? What is it you think is really important to know and remember about the Mongols in order to have a clearer and better understanding of them? I also want to give credit today to where I got my information for a lot of this slideshow. Um, much of it was written based on the book um, Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. Um, it was written by a, a whole host of other AP teachers whose names I no longer have in a good list, um, but they put together the initial kind of bare bones of this slideshow. And then I added some things in. Most of the primary sources I drew from the DBQ project, and I just want to acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of scholarship by a lot of really smart people that went into this video today. So thank you to all of those people. And AP students, thank you for watching, for sticking with this whole thing. I hope that you um, have been able to add something to your knowledge of the Mongols and that you are ready now to apply your knowledge of the Mongols into some new settings. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye, everybody.